When I was 29 years old, my first son, Brett, was born. I was happy, I was scared, pretty much like any normal father. But one thing that he didn't realize was that I was counting on him to be my savior. I'd been battling a 10-year addiction to cocaine and alcohol, and I thought him coming into my life would stop that. Two months after his birth, I'm working in Wichita, Kansas, and he and his mom come to visit. And they're there for a week, and it was fantastic. It was, it was this beautiful week with this little baby that I loved and I kissed and I had emotions with that I had absolutely no idea that I even possessed. Because as an addict, I had never even felt these things. So I was astounded to find myself dropping them off at the airport and immediately driving to the hood where I spent the next six days smoking crack and drinking. That binge ended in gunfire and police, which is not that unusual for me at that point in my life. But I sat there on the ground in this dumpy motel watching the police go through my car, and this policeman is, is reaching under the driver's seat, and he pulls out a crack pipe. Any normal person would have said, oh my God, I'm really in trouble. What went through my head was, so that's where that was. <laughs> I wonder if there's anything left in there. Pretty sick thinking, but it's where I was at that time. I really, I really just had no choice. But I knew I had to change. So at that moment, I finally made a decision, although it was the same decision I'd made a hundred times earlier, that this was going to be the last time. I was going to quit. I always said that quitting's easy. I've done it a hundred times, you know, and it, and it had always turned out to be true, and I always felt like there was another time to quit, but this time was different. I had a son. I had somebody that I was responsible for, somebody I needed to care for. So... I threw out some sort of uh, ask, a prayer, if you want, to myself, to the universe. And that night, I went to an AA meeting. The next morning, I put on my running shoes, and I went for a run. And over the next three years, I pretty much did those two things every single day. And over that three-year period of time, I ran somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 marathons, because clearly I had that whole addiction thing under control. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Um, I finally reached the point, though, where even marathons weren't, they just weren't doing it for me. I wasn't nervous anymore when I stepped up to the line. I actually knew I could do it. And I had already learned that for me, taking on things that I was afraid of were teaching me, that was teaching me the greatest lessons. And so I wanted to go farther. So I started doing these, these crazy runs, three and four hundred miles across the Atacama Desert, the Gobi Desert. I raced across the jungles in Vietnam and Borneo and Fiji. And then finally, I did this event in the Amazon, going across this huge chunk of the Amazon jungle. And one night in the middle of the race, I'm laying there in a jungle hammock with this cacophony of sound around me. And one of my buddies who I'd been racing with just kind of said out loud, I mean, I don't know if he's talking to me or not. He said, I wonder if anybody's ever run all the way across the Sahara Desert. And so I popped my head up, and I said, well, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Why would anybody do something like that? But it stuck with me. I couldn't get rid of this idea. So when I got back home to the U.S., I started to do some research, and I found out that, in fact, no one had ever run the entire length of the Sahara Desert from coast to coast. Turns out for pretty good reason, actually. And, <laughs> and I decided that I wanted to do that. Firsts in the adventure world in this day and age are really difficult to come by. They're, they're not an easy thing to find. And so I started to tell people, I'm going to run across this, this Sahara Desert, the whole thing. I'm just going to run. And people had known me <laughs> for a little while, and they weren't necessarily surprised, but I heard over and over that it was impossible, that there was absolutely no way I was going to be able to pull this off. And so I found, and I learned this in sobriety, I found that I let them take the impossibility. They could have that. And I began to take possession of the possibility.